This is the day that's given to us. Beyond anything we could create or earn, whether deserved or undeserved, this day comes to us as a gift. A gift from the universe, a gift from God, a gift from life itself. So come and let us worship with gratitude for this and so many gifts, with humility for our shortcomings, resilience to face the challenges ahead, and let us worship with hope that we will continue to transform our lives and to transform our world. Good morning, and welcome to our virtual worship service here at the Unitarian Church of Baton Rouge. I'm uh, Reverend Eric Poza, pleased to be uh, with you this morning. Uh, we have a community that may not be meeting in person right now, though we hope to be again before long, uh, but we have much going on. We do encourage you, uh, if this is your first time with us especially, to uh, take a look at our church website to learn more about the activities of this congregation, to learn more about what we have to offer to you and to one another during these times. We are so glad that you are with us. Welcome. The Race to the Top of the Tree Deep in the green shadowed forest under the spreading branches of the great old oak tree, there lived a family of squirrels. It was a very large family with parents and grandparents and great grandparents and hundreds of squirrel cousins and all of them loved to climb trees. One morning, three squirrels were having a discussion about the best way to get to the top of the tree. Straight up the trunk, said the dark gray squirrel. But the trunk doesn't go all the way to the top, said the light gray squirrel. You have to go on the branches sometime. But when, said the silver gray squirrel, and, and which branch? The big one, said the gray squirrel. 
No, the crooked one on the right, said the light gray squirrel. And they got to arguing with much chittering and cheeing and snipping of their teeth and snapping of their fluffy tails. This is silly, said the silver gray squirrel finally, with a snap and a flick of her own fluffy tail. Stop talking about it and just have a race. All the squirrels liked that idea. Dozens of them gathered at the base of the big oak tree. Hundreds more gathered to watch. And when the great grandmother squirrel dropped the acorn and the acorn hit the ground, they were off. Some, like the dark gray squirrel, went straight up the trunk. Others went around and around the trunk like a great corkscrew slide. Others ran for the pine tree and climbed all the way to the top, then made the daring leap across 15 feet of open sky to the branches of the old oak tree. Now, it is a very long climb to the top of the oak tree. Many of the squirrels, since they are squirrels and squirrels are always hungry, stop to eat an acorn or nibble on a pine cone. Some of the squirrels turned the climb into a game of chase and forgot all about the race. But the dark gray squirrel and the light gray squirrel kept climbing. The dark gray squirrel went up the big branch. The light gray squirrel went up the crooked branch. They went higher and higher. The branches got thinner and thinner. The wind grew stronger and stronger. They reached the top at the same time. It's pretty up here, said the dark gray squirrel, holding on with all four paws as the very thin branches snapped and swayed in the very strong breeze. It is, said the light gray squirrel, holding on tight too, ready to go down. Yes, said the dark gray squirrel. And the silver gray squirrel, she stayed on the ground. She said to herself, it doesn't matter how far or how fast or which direction you go. There are lots of ways to the top of the tree or the middle of the tree or to a different tree entirely. In fact, she said, picking up an acorn with her two front paws, there are plenty of good things to be found right here on the ground. Well, we share with one another in so many ways as we worship together. Let us take this moment for sharing the life transitions that may have impacted us by virtually sharing our tradition of this church of placing a stone inside the bowl of our chalice. I'll place them physically, but invite you, especially if you're viewing where there's a chat available, to type into the chat. Some put an asterisk for their stones. Others will name specifically who it's for. Please, let us share now. And we light the flame in our chalice, the symbol of our freely covenanted Unitarian Universalist faith, saying together the words, with hope to make this a better world, we light this flame. Its light is a symbol of the power of love. I was raised in one of those small southern towns where when I went to high school in particular, faith was assumed. 
And I don't just mean any faith. I mean evangelical Protestant Christianity. Now, I went to a public high school, and so you might be having thoughts about church-state separation issues, but, well, those issues were widely ignored in my hometown. It was so strong that even the official school calendar listed the date, time, and place for the baccalaureate service, the religious ceremony to honor high school graduates held every year at First Baptist Church. And it was widely expected that all graduating seniors, regardless of their relationship with First Baptist or with the faith that church professed, would attend. So maybe I should not have been surprised when my English teacher announced in class one day who among us would be giving the opening and closing prayers at each of these two services, the baccalaureate and the graduation ceremony. After all, this was the honors English class, the smart kids in our grade level, and I'm sure school administrators were convinced the smart kids would all have faith in Jesus Christ. But what really surprised me was when the last name was called, yeah, it was me. I was the one chosen to have the honor of offering the closing prayer at my high school's graduation. And yes, by the way, the graduation was the secular ceremony, but not the religious one. But again, they ignored that distinction. They wanted their faith expressed by mild-mannered, non-church-going me, and at the time, quietly agnostic me. After the names were called, my best friend Nick and I looked at each other in confusion. His had been the first name announced for the opening prayer at the church service, but I was pretty sure from previous conversations that he was just as agnostic as I was. And after a brief whispered conversation between us, which confirmed my suspicion about his religious views, we decided we had to say something. We went up to the teacher's desk, uh, shared with her our surprise that this had happened without our knowledge or permission. And for the first time, we let a teacher know our own religious views. And I will say that from her, we got a sympathetic hearing. Now, she was a church-going Christian also, but unlike a lot of people at my school, she was not a Christian supremacist. I did not know the term Christian supremacist at the time, but looking back, it definitely fit a lot of people there. We discussed with her whether or not we should take the issue further, but eventually Nick and I decided that it was a losing battle. I'm not proud of it now, but I bowed to the religious peer pressure. So as my high school graduation ceremony ended, I stepped up to the podium and offered a prayer. And it wasn't a prayer addressed to the spirit of life and love, God known by many names and mystery beyond all naming, that I pray to now. No, it was offered to a, quote, dear heavenly father, unquote, that I was advised to address, but did not believe existed. You know, it's challenging to stay committed to what is most deeply true for us and to avoid committing to that which is not. And that's true all the more so in challenging times such as this pandemic and particularly the surge that we're under now. Yet the surge gives us a need and also an opportunity to prepare to equip ourselves for re-engaging our collective lives in our world more fully and hopefully fairly soon. This week and next, I'm going to be considering some of what it is, particularly in our Unitarian Universalist faith, that can help us in these ways, what it is in our shared faith tradition to which we may recommit ourselves in this time. And I'll say more about that shortly.
there are many kinds of faith that may be dispensed with, but there remains one kind which no one can live without. We do not need to use the word faith to refer to it. The word confidence will serve just as well. No one and no culture can for long maintain a dynamic and creative attitude toward life without the confidence that human life has some important meaning and that resources are available for the fulfillment of this meaning. Both the non-religious and the religious person are concerned with these issues and they are people of faith whether they use the word God or not. Indeed, the rejection of the word God may reveal confidence of some sort. It is a sign of devotion. We live by our devotions. We live by our love for our God. All alike place their confidence in something, whether it be in human nature, reason, scientific method, church, nation, Bible, or God. There are two dimensions of human experience that have some relevance for us. The intimate aspects of our lives and the ultimate aspects of our world. If that pairing sounds familiar, particularly to those of you involved in one of our branches groups, our small group ministry program, I'm not surprised. I understand the branches groups have often been framed as uh, an invitation to intimacy and ultimacy. And that's what I want to focus on these two Sundays. Next week, I'll talk about what it might mean to recommit to intimacy, which has a much broader meaning than some might understand it to have. But today, ultimacy. And that surprises some people that we might use that word because we do differ from other faith traditions that are more prevalent in our state in that uh, UUism uh, does not require any particular understanding of what is ultimate in our lives. But I do think that our faith tradition has an approach to committing to that which we do find ultimate, even as we encourage diverse views of what that is. And we also encourage one another as those views of the ultimate change. Now, my theology certainly has changed over the years. I am a good deal more theistic today than I was when I was 18 years old. But I still would not choose to call the God that I now have faith in by the name Father, nor would I call God heavenly. No, for me, God is all too present with us to dismiss to some far-flung heavenly realm. And parenthood is not a primary metaphor for me in associating with the divine. And it's certainly not male-gendered parenthood. Indeed, much of my struggle as a youth and as a young adult with belief in God was with these particular doctrines and language about God, which my evangelical neighbors had insisted upon. But once I'd broken free of those rigid barriers, I felt free to embrace a worldview that still had space for something greater than just myself, with the God of my understanding. Now, of course, many of us Unitarian Universalists go through some form of these struggles to clarify what's ultimate in our lives, and that's good. Our living faith tradition has always rejected that adherence to a particular belief and instead emphasized the unity of our covenantal promises for how we're going to be together and behave together as a congregation. Affirming and promoting our fourth principle, the free and responsible search for truth and meaning, is a way of expressing this openness to many beliefs. But the responsibility 
that comes with this freedom, well, it can feel daunting at times. Perhaps like I did those years ago, you may have had times of questioning what you do believe, what you should believe about creation or divinity or other theological themes. If our liberal religious tradition, as you use, does not tell us what we must believe about God, does it offer us any insights on what is good to believe? We'll explore that momentarily. I thank you, God, for most this amazing day, for the leaping, greenly spirits of trees and a blue, true dream of sky, and for everything which is natural, which is infinite, which is yes. I, who have died, am alive again today, and this is the sun's birthday. This is the birthday of life and of love and wings and of the gay, great, happening, illimitably earth. How can tasting, touching, hearing, seeing, breathing, any lifted from the no of all nothing, human merely being, doubt unimaginable you. Now the ears of my ears awake, and now the eyes of my eyes are open. I invite us into a time of deeper sharing, a time of prayer in which I invite you to reach deep within, reach far beyond yourself, to connect with that which you know to be sacred or ultimate. Let us pray. Spirit of life and love, God known by so many names. Mystery beyond all our naming, we gather together this day here at, in some ways, the height of summer and in some ways at its end, knowing that we are staying apart in some respects and coming together in others as our children return to school along with those who work in our schools. And knowing that in the midst of the surge of this pandemic, there are so many who are struggling with their own illness, with the illness or recent loss of loved ones. So many who work in hospitals and healthcare who are overwhelmed at this perilous time. Help us in this time when there is so much that would pull us away from what is deepest for us each, to stay connected, to find ways to recommit to the values that we treasure most deeply, most sincerely, so that we may move forward. We may, when the time is right, come together anew renewed and prepared for the world that is to come. So may it be for us all. Amen. Thank you. 
Indeed, I do believe that Unitarian Universalism offers us some guidance for how we conceive of the divine without requiring particular doctrines about it. And I return to the work of an influential Unitarian theologian for insights into this subject, James Luther Adams, author of one of the readings we heard earlier. In another essay of his, Adams wrote, the principal things that concern me are intimacy and ultimacy, the intimate and the ultimate. That's where our branches program got the phrase. Not only did these two interlocking subjects interest him personally, but as a theologian who thought long and hard on the meaning and purpose of the church, Adams thought these were the primary gifts that people could receive from church involvement. The ultimate, of course, refers to our highest values, beliefs, concerns, that which is worthy to provide us with primary guidance throughout our lives. Now, in a lot of other churches here in the Baton Rouge area, a lot of people would simply nod here and say, oh yeah, you mean God. And for members of those churches, and for some of us, Yes, that is what it means. But again, we Unitarian Universalists articulate and draw strength from that which is ultimate in a glorious diversity of ways. Some find the name God to be less helpful for that which is ultimate for them. But that does not mean that nothing fills the role of ultimacy in their lives, just that the ultimate is different for many of us. Let me bring back uh, an illustration for ultimacy, which I shared a few weeks ago as the lesson for that week's worship. It's an adaptation of the parable from India of the people in a dark room encountering an elephant for the first time. The one who feels the elephant's leg says the elephant is like a tree trunk. The one feeling the trunk of the elephant compares it to a large snake and the one touching the tail claims the elephant is like a vine. Few people might think of a tree, a snake, or a vine when they first see an elephant in daylight, but these explanations fit the experiences of the people in that darkened room. They're not defining the elephant's reality as tree, snake, or vine. They're using an analogy. They're using a metaphor to describe their encounter. And so it goes for our encounters with the ultimate, for our attempts to express the mystery behind which ultimacy lies. For indeed, we can express these only imperfectly, only through metaphor. That's part of why every Sunday as we enter into our time of prayer, I invite you to connect with that which you find sacred. That invitation is meant to honor this diversity of spiritual experience. Of course, the most common metaphor, most common name in our culture for the ultimate is God. And it's also a name that's loaded with connotations. Some of us don't like to use this name because we reject so many of those contra so many of those connotations. Turns out we you use our not the only ones who engage with these tensions over God's nature. A rabbi once told me at a clergy conference, a clergy training conference, that while Jews have long held a great variety of images of the divine, there are almost no contemporary Jews in America who view God as, quote, the conscious author of the universe. Those are his words. And in some cases, we're even going to reject the connotation of existence. We're going to say that we don't believe God exists. It's something that you use have debated for over a century, and frankly, sometimes we've been obnoxious about it, which I think is a lot of the reason why in recent years, more and more you use are looking to put this debate over the existence of God to the side. One person who did this really effectively, I thought, was the influential liberal Christian theologian, Paul Tillich. And to give you a sense of where his theology lies on the spectrum, James Luther Adams, the Unitarian theologian, studied under Tillich. 
And he simply removed all of the specific connotations from the word God. He uses the word as the generic name, as the general metaphor to label that which is of ultimate concern to a person, that which serves a godlike role in that person's life. Emerson reminded us that a person will worship something, and Tillich simply uses the word God to refer to that something. For some people, their God is wealth, or the nation, or political power, for these are the things they treat as ultimate in their lives. For others, abstract qualities or virtues, love, peace, goodness, become the ultimate concern. Still others concern themselves with key qualities or processes of our reality, human community, life, nature, creativity. It could more generally be the universe or the source of being rather than a separate being. And yes, some of us view an ultimate being with more traditional notions such as personality, supernaturalism, etc. And I should note that each of the hymns chosen for today's worship was intended to celebrate a different ultimate focus. Human community and we would be one, God and be thou our vision, nature and blue boat home, and also in the closing hymn. The key question is not whether God exists. Here's the question. Is that which we find ultimate in our lives up to the task of meeting our ultimate needs? To some extent, it depends on what their ultimate concern, what that ultimate concern is. But how do we decide if it is? And I'll conclude shortly with some ways to think this through individually and an invitation to consider it collectively. But for the next portion of our service, I'll switch to our other microphone. It's good to make a transition as we enter into this time of sharing, this time of sharing of our generosity, and our gratitude, out of our gratitude for the religious community of which we are a part. In so sharing, may you express a piece of what is of value, perhaps even ultimate for you, as the morning's offering is gratefully received.
Well, even as we at UCBR vary so widely from one another in what we find of ultimate worth, the fact that something plays an ultimate role in each of our lives can be a unifying theme in our collective religious experience. We can affirm diversity in ultimates, yet unity in ultimacy for this religious community. For we Unitarian Universalists have long understood that diversity of experiences and metaphors and the strength We've also understood that the strength in this diversity is that we can learn from one another. We can enrich one another's spiritual lives with the insights we gain through that sharing within and beyond this congregation. And that can be true in so many aspects of our lives. I think of uh, my old friend John when I think of this, uh, a committed Buddhist who lives on the East Coast, and an equally committed social justice activist. But unlike most Buddhist activists, John went to seminary, a predominantly Christian seminary, albeit a fairly progressive one, to study for what's known as movement chaplaincy, interfaith chaplaincy within social justice movements. Now, I may not share John's adherence to the first first noble truth of Buddhism that all is suffering, nor his belief in nirvana, but I recognize how these beliefs lead him to alleviate the personal and the communal suffering of those who fight against the structural suffering of injustice and oppression. And it gives me new insights into how the pastoral care that I engage with members of congregations I serve can go hand in hand with issues of justice, far more than many of us recognize. And that's why I often advise there is deep value to exploring that which is ultimate for you and living by it, recommitting to it. That may sound easier said than done, and it is certainly not a a quick process for most of us, but I do think that each of us, that each of you can ask ourselves a couple of key questions which can help clarify what it is we're looking at. What are my deepest needs and what meets those needs? What values or actions or commitments do I return to over and over? throughout the changes in my life? And what do I hear from others, other sources, other people, that resonate most deeply for me? Now, these are individual questions, and I think they are useful and important exercises for us. And there is also a collective dimension to exploring what is ultimate for us. As a congregation, clarifying our ultimate values, our ultimate commitments, our ultimate vision for our gathered community is a vital process. And particularly as we're reaching, approaching the end of this transitional period in this church, our our senior minister newly settled, uh, but going through the search now in its early phases of finding the new second minister for this church. It's a good time to do some clarifying work on this. Now, this was begun in one way by this congregation almost a year and a half ago with the uh, articulation of the holy why, and that work coincided with the very beginning of the pandemic. So I think it was wise for our board to institute a strategic planning process for this congregation, which is in its early phases now. And I invite you to keep a a close eye on our communications from the church because we expect that there will, uh, in the next several weeks, 
be opportunities for gathering, hopefully in person, moving to Zoom if we have to because of COVID reasons, uh, gathering for uh, cottage meetings, for small group meetings where we can reflect on and discern our insights into what is the value, the commitment, the visions that we hold for ourselves together in addition to individually. Rather than being pressured into asserting a worldview that you don't hold, the way I allowed myself to be at my high school graduation, my hope is that this time of exploration of what is ultimate in your life and in the church more deeply will engage the values, the commitments, and the choices by which we live. And when we share them with one another, and we do so responsibly, responsibly, and we do so in freedom. May we deepen our collective life as a congregation together to live more faithfully within the bonds of our Unitarian Universalist faith. So may it be for us all. Amen. Let us go forth from this sacred time, from these many sacred places in which we have gathered. Go forth knowing ourselves to be graced with blessings, blessings of freedom, blessings of wholeness. For though this worship service now ends, our service begins anew. Let us go forth then to serve this hurting world in the spirit of love. Thank you for joining with us. Go in peace. <laughs>